and welcome back Boneheads. Once again, this is Rich, I am joined by Ben. Hey everybody, uh, welcome to episode 3. On today's episode, we're going to be talking about mixed teams, again. We're going to be talking about terrain and obstacles in Blood Bowl, as well as the usual games, hobby, news and star players. We also have an international guest with us today, fresh from Australia. We've got our friend from Wobble, the Iron Man, Rick. Hello. How are you doing today, Rick? Yeah, good, good. Lovely job. Thank you very much for joining us. So, Rick, how did you get into Blood Bowl? Gosh, it's going back almost to 1987. I think I, I saw Blood Bowl on a on a shelf in a shop and was intrigued, and so I saved up my pocket money and and bought it. Yeah, went from there. Gosh, I, through school, met guys that were also intrigued. I mean, this is early days, isn't it? Proper so, early days. So not only is Rick the Iron Man of Blood Bowl and has everything. Um, the reason he has everything is because he is a 31-year Blood Bowl veteran. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is probably why he did so well in our last league. Yes, very well. Yeah. Frustratingly so. Hit to the peg by Lewis. The friendliest yeah. game I've ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. Their the last game they played was an insanely friendly one. This, oh, one was more, <laughs> this was more like polite silence. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was a tough one, one, actually. Lewis played, played very well on that one. Rick, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, now we're going to move into our first topic. Okay, wonderful. So, over to Blood Bowl News. Rich, what have you got for us this week? Not a huge amount, unfortunately. There is nothing going on in the world of Kickstarter or Indiegogo. I suppose it's summer. It is. Everyone's wrapped up. Everyone's spent all their money, apparently. (laughs) But there is a new video game coming out, Blood Bowl Death Zone. Basically, it's a 1v1 game, playing online against another coach. You pick a star player, pick a team, and then a sponsor, and then just literally go for it. 5v5, it's just a new Blood Bowl. That sounds, that sounds good, I can't believe I've missed this. I know, I, I, it's something that I've only just discovered and came out about two, three weeks ago. Brilliant, well we'll have to, we'll have to download that and give it a go and see what we're going with. It's fairly cheap as well. Like, you can pick it up for $10, I think it is. So it's, is this on Steam? On Steam. But no, it does look quite good, a bit of fun. Um, it's more real time as opposed to turn by turn based. Don't know the ins and outs, but I will discover, I will spend money, and I will come back with more information. <laughs> so good for a quick Blood Bowl, really. Definitely good for a quick Blood Bowl. What was it called again? Blood Bowl Death Zone. Blood Bowl Death Zone. I think yeah. there's an app already. Blood Bowl Death Zone. Uh, but, um, if I download it now, we'll never finish recording. No. <laughs> It'll still be here next week. Okay, was there anything else miniature based news? We have our first casting of our Bonehead. Ogre miniature. So last week, uh, Rich surprised me. I mean, we, I knew I paid for it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> knew we were getting a model sculpted. And he surprised me mid-recording about showing us some pictures and what it would look like. We've now got the master copy. We've got a master copy each. We've got a master copy each of the model and it looks great fun. It looks awesome. Absolutely yeah. awesome. We've already got the production set up as well. So hopefully we'll have a, a few more coming. We'll um, pop this straight on Facebook and Twitter as soon as we get some decent models and we're yes. going to start painting mine up. But basically what we want to do is we want to get our production ones on the go so we can get our, our buddy Ian. Yes, uh, our award-winning. award-winning painter Ian, friend of the, book, <laughs> friend of the show. Um, we're going to get him to paint one up, make it look as good as it possibly can. It's got quite an old-school feel to it. Mm. It's a bit skinnier than some of the new models, but he's still kind of big presence. I'll put yeah. him on a 40mm face. Just yeah, I think it makes sense. He's 45mm to the top of the head, of one of the heads. Yeah, he dwarfs the Chaos players. Yeah. So nice. that's his strength four base. He's obviously strength five. Yes, I'm of just, course. Uh, yeah. So what we'd like to do is once we get the model painted up and we've got a good, a good demo of him, we'll pop him out there because we would love for you guys to start brewing up some rules for him. Oh, I was going to say, is there some star player rules? Well, we've had a couple of ideas, but yeah. actually, it seems like too much fun to just, to just do it up. ourselves. Yeah. I can see you starting to think of <laughs> the rules already. Cogs are turning. Yeah. It's just, I just, I would very much. Like it if we didn't, uh, if nobody suggested rolling bonehead twice. Um, yes. That might just be one of the least fun things you can do in the ball. Yeah. Um, however, throwing teammate twice would be excellent, so extra points for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with regards to like miniatures, that's obviously the most important miniature news you'll probably hear in August, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. But I thought I'd chat about a company that I've used previously. So I, after joining you guys, very shortly after joining you guys, decided to have a mat made uh, with my blood ball pitch on. So, logo for my Helmgard Rooks, the human team, the only human team in Wobble. Yeah, and renowned for having at least two strength ball blitzers. At all times, yeah. regardless. I bought one of their mats a short while ago, and I brought it with me to discuss, to look at, get some free publicity to. That's right. So, what material is it made of? It's neoprene. 
So it's basically like a, a mouse mat. It is stitched all around the outside. So there's no loose ends, there's no sort of frayed bits that can come loose or, or otherwise. So it's a blubble pitch size mouse mat. It's, it's bigger than a blood bowl pitch. Um, See, you've got some excellent design features, so what else have they added it for you for? So we've got the the standard sort of benches, the injury box and all that. We've got the turn counters, scores, re-rolls, as well as the scatter template, the throwing template, the kickoff table, the injury table, and a, a, a helpful little thing to make sure you know how to play the kick. But all of it's completely customisable. That is really, really, really clever. The like colours, uh, you can change exactly what it is, the with the sort of, whether it's grass, whether it's astro granite, he's got graphics for all. Fantastic, to be honest. He's included my logo, which I got from a very cheap gentleman on Fiverr. <laughs> Brilliant. As well as changing sort of the, the skulls on the, the injury box and otherwise to, to rook skulls. So, so, Rick, you've got almost everything that has ever been made for Blood Bowl. How would you feel about picking up one of these nuts? I'm really impressed with the quality. Really impressed, actually. I, I haven't got a neoprene fill and, uh, yet. Yet. <laughs> and, uh, this yeah. is fantastic. Now, I know you've got a Dentist Titanic is coming out this summer, so that's probably where most of mine and Rick's money is going to go on, on the hobby budget for this month. Mm. But at some point, I think I might have to pick up one of these nuts as well. So, where did you get it from? It's a uh, gentleman who is coming called Maelstrom Gaming Mats. M A E L S T R O N. We'll put a, a link in there. Yeah. In the water. Absolutely. Guy in Canada um, makes it all. Doesn't make them in Europe at the moment purely because he can't find the quality he wants. So he's not skimping on quality at all. Um, a one man band, but he's also started doing uh, mats for BB7 tournaments. Oh, brilliant. And, oh, and otherwise. Mm. So he's he's branched out of what he's doing. His website is including goblin style pitches, swamp pitches, oh, dwarf pitches, a college rules type of pitch. So that sort of fun feel, I suppose. But can customise anything you like. The this, this stuff he does is fantastic. It cost me about 100 quid, including delivery. Well, having scratch built a couple of blood bowl boards in my time, and I think yeah. Rick can back me up on this one, 100 quid is probably good effort. I think it's, good it's really good quality. Really he, good he takes his time. He'll talk to you about what you actually want, what you don't yeah. want. If you don't like something, he'll change it. And he'll, he will spend time making sure that it's right for you. Like I've got the, the slogan of my guys in the end zone. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah. just something that's a bit different and it's just it's fantastic plus it's rollable like you can roll it up stick a couple of elastic bands around it and take it wherever you want which well, is what I'm doing on Saturday yeah exactly <laughs> very useful for taking to tournaments so yes. I'm planning on building a proper 3D thing but I think a rollable mount is going to be far more sensible I will enjoy watching you carry <laughs> your with the, carry ever, the, the ever problem of storage as well yeah doesn't it just it doesn't fit on a table it doesn't fit on a table no normally Oh, we see, like a living room table. On a living room table. Oh, yeah, we fit on a, on any sort of normal gaming table. But on a living room table, it, it, it overhangs, and obviously if it's fabric, as it is, it, it doesn't really stand well. <laughs> when so, you need it so if you've got a small table, or you've only got a coffee table, you do need a bit of 3 by 2 MDF or something. Yeah, to just to be able to keep yeah. it rigid, but it's, it's brilliant. Yeah, I feel a bit better about that. It says, uh, I'll just be carrying my ball, and you'll be carrying a bit of MDF and the roll. <laughs> 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 but I still, I still think you went out of this one. That's yeah, brilliant. That looks brilliant. really great. So that's male strong mats. Yep. And um, like Rich said, we'll pop the link into the show notes. Okay. So a couple of other things that are kicking around. It's not exactly news, but it is things that are upcoming. So there's um, there's some Blood Bowl tournaments that some of our listeners would like us to talk about very quickly. Yep. The first one is in September. So September the 15th. So fast coming up. It'll probably be about two weeks uh, two weeks after this episode airs yeah. but it's the Stunty Slam hosted at Element Games in Stockport, England yes. it is a Stunty Cup which is brilliant so the Goblin Halfling Ogre Underworld with no Skaven so my skink team wouldn't be allowed to play no fumble teams no no, no it's just uh, actual Blood Bowl Stunty plus the Underworld which is really good which is understandable yeah like a, a, there's still a lot of fun to have in there mm. two mutated trolls and a bunch of goblins with claw and stuff I think would be brutal yeah Great fun. Yeah. Uh, but I, I would play that. I think I'd probably get that. I'm, I'm yeah. all over that. A lot of fun for that. So that's the 15th of September, Stunty Slam. We've got the North Wales Carnage Cup coming up in November. Oh, yes, we're hoping to attend. We are hoping to attend that one. That's the 17th of so. November, and that's in Wrexham, UK. So that looks like it's uh, the NAF teams plus Bretonian and Core. Yes. Which is good, so there'll be some interesting teams there. That one's a four-rounder. It is a four-rounder. And that's so uh, we're looking at a four-round drive, four, four games of Blood Bowl. And then four hours back. Yes, but you know, why not? Hotel stay. 
I think yeah, I and a hotel stay. Yeah, I think, you know, we have a few beers in the evening. Stay it would be a shame, wouldn't it? Yeah, absolutely. The last one I've got written down is the River City Dungeon Bowl uh, on the 8th of December. This one is in Jacksonville, Florida at uh, Cool Stuff Games, and it is a Dungeon Bowl tournament. Mm. So it looks like they rotate fixed dungeon maps between them, probably less random, more open to, yeah. to give that. I haven't read the rules back to see how they're going to manage the time on that, because obviously the last Dungeon Bowl game I witnessed, due to my own fault of not creating the rules, um, <laughs> did last a little bit while, so it would be interesting to see how they run a tournament for that. But yeah, really, really excited for that. And we've got Mana Bowl coming up. Uh, we would have already been by the time we finished this episode. Yeah, yeah. It's this coming weekend. It is. Have you got your team list sorted? No. No? Oh, no. Have you got the team list? Oh, no. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, oh, this is this is how tournaments work. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, it's okay. I've budgeted time for it. We're going on Saturday? We are going Saturday. Yeah, I've budgeted Friday night to think like <laughs> <laughs> I think I've got Wednesday. Other than that, it's, um, it's trying to fight the wife and kids to get the time. Unlike Rick, if I gave it to him, he'd knock it out in about three hours. And, uh, and away. Only on a Saturday morning when I was <laughs> watching Aussie Rules. <laughs> Only on a Saturday morning watching Aussie Rules. So on to games and hobby. Let's start with Rick. So yes. Rick, what games have you played? Football. Oh, good. <laughs> good. Yeah, that's a good start. <laughs> on topic. Uh, what did you get in game-wise? Uh, well, I guess the last few games have been mixed teams. Yes. We've been trying some mixed teams. So I, I played a game against Rich and a game against Ben. And did you guys get a game in? We did. Yes, we did. It was appalling. It wasn't as bad as, as, as our game for me. But I, I lost to you. You did lose to me. I didn't even remember how it went. I think a lot of my people died. I, the the injury and the decay of Oxford you was not a pretty sight. Yeah, I think there's pictures of it somewhere. Isn't there? there is pictures of it yeah. somewhere. Yeah. Not going to post Evidence. Them. I might. <laughs> <laughs> But no, it was um, it was a it was a heavy hitting game, but great fun, very great fun. We'll, we'll talk about mixed teams a little bit later on. Well. We, you know, Rick has been helping us out and uh, playing some games with some some random rules that we put together, trying it. and helped us put it together, which mm. was brilliant. What teams did you play, Rick? Uh, what did I play? I played Wood Elves and Halflings. That was great fun. That, that was crazy. Yeah. That was against my ogre and orc team. No. Yes, it was. Was it Ogres and Orcs? Ogres, Ogres and Orcs, orcs. yeah. Double O. That was it. Um, Ogres and Orcs. That was great fun. Why was that great fun? And women halflings can't catch. I'll tell you that. Can't catch, but goblins and snoppings can fly. <laughs> <laughs> seeing three tree men on one side of the pitch yep. was, was gratuitous. Yeah. It was, yeah, it really was. That was actually. great fun. It, it was scary. <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult to counteract that. And then uh, we got that game in. And yes, and what did I play there? Wood Elves and Dwarves. And Dwarves, and what a great combo. It was insanely good. However, I don't think it was broken. I think I just played it wrong. Because there's definitely vulnerability there. Mm-hmm. You know, you take out the Wood Elves, you're left with just Dwarves, and I know we talked about that. And um, you played a hell of a game. What was the final score? Four oh, one, wasn't it? It was at least four one. It may have been <laughs> a five one. Yeah. It, 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 it was. Look, I only took Dwarf linemen. Yep. Uh, so if I'd lost Wood Elves... That, that's uh, what I should have done. I should have just forgotten about that, disengaged and gone after the war dancers or the catchers. If I'd taken out two of your catchers, mm-hmm. it would have made a big difference. You still have war dancers, who are the best player in the game for, for, the, for a reason. Mm-hmm. can't believe they're oh, in the UK, yeah, more expensive uh, than Guts of Us. Thoroughly <laughs> impressed with war dancers. Yeah, pretty yeah. fragile. They're not that well. Armor seven. I think I did manage to knock one out. At one if you point. get a power, it's, 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 it starts to get a little bit scary. Yeah, well, particularly with the big boy. Lodge leap, brilliant. But it was a really nice combo to to, to play with. Actually, both of them. The, the the halflings and wood elves and wood elves and dwarves were great fun. Yeah. Great fun. Good. So you got a good couple of great fun games in. Mm-hmm. I played a BB sevens with Ian. Oh, did you really? While you two were playing your your mixed team. Me and Ian got a BB7s game. Yes, in. Oh, brilliant. Playing so. Lucky Dip with Rick's teams. <laughs> that yeah. was great. So, that was great. Right. Yeah. So at, at Rick's abode, there is a, um, a a set of drawers, and you open it up, and there are teams, Blood Bowl teams. In. So instead of me and Ian picking a team, we decided to pick a draw, and then whatever draw was picked, we use that team. It's the most respectable game filing system. See. It's beautiful. You walk into his lounge, he's got some beautifully handcrafted tables. Oh all. my lord. And on the side, he's got a load of, you know, drawers. Yeah. It's like, oh, okay, that's, you know, that makes sense. This is where he keeps all his money. Um, <laughs> <laughs> much, much, much money. 
And uh, no, in every single draw is about four, three or four blood ball teams. Yeah. And it was amazing. And yes, you did actually just go right in. Left, middle, right. Which yep. draw do you want? And so right, left hand side, third draw from the bottom or something like that. Yeah, and orcs came out. Yeah. And then I, I picked mine from the right side, I think, and I came out with lizardmen. So we created a team each there and then, and, and Ian handed my arse to me. <laughs> Quite simply, I can't get a hold of BB7s, but I love it. Did you take any rerolls this time? No. No. Uh, did Ian take any rerolls? Oh, no, I did. I took a reroll. Oh. And Ian didn't. Well, I'll tell you what, the experience of playing Blood Bowl 7s and not having rerolls has, has made me think about my Stunty Cup weekend team. Um, instead of taking an extra reroll, I'm putting six into Fan Factor. Because oh, if right. I can win the fame bonus, not only would it be good for uh, brilliant coaching, yeah. which apparently comes up all of the time during fans. Yeah. during fans' brilliant coaching, you get the bonuses for that, but also if you get the throw a rock. So yeah. I'm thinking, actually, instead of that re-roll, I might get a re-roll you could get based on brilliant coaching. You know, that's not bad thinking, because the the, uh, the mixed teams, you're limited with re-roll options, and Halfling and Wood Elf team that I played against you, Rich, mm. I had the phone. You did. And that gave me bonus re-rolls. Mm. Uh, Everyone I play against gets the bonus re-rolls. <laughs> well, that was and, and that picks up what you need, you know, it's, yeah, it was good. It does come through, and it's, I've enjoyed playing with fewer rerolls because I'm thinking more about what I'm doing as opposed to going, you know what, let's just yeah. go for it. So yeah. I've got a reroll, what's it matter? And you actually start thinking tactically as opposed to just going, ah, it's all right, I've got five rerolls and a lever, it's fine. Yeah, we'll just make that block right. anyway and go for it, I can reroll it, it'll probably be fine. No, you play to the ball, you play to the game. Yeah, yeah you do. Um, exactly, and I feel that potentially next league, I probably won't be taking any more than three rerolls anyway. Mm. We'll do it because it's just. <laughs> <laughs> and why is that, Rick? I'm doing vampires. And how many how many rerolls are you planning on taking? I'll go with five. You're going to go for five and two wow. vamps. Five and two vamps. Yeah. Brilliant. So building and gluing. Rick, have you done any hobby this month? Uh, I have been, as you guys know, I've been working on my dungeon bowl board, and oh, uh, it's finished. It's finished. Mm. What did you get done for it? So we had a trial game, but at that stage. To explain, it's multi-level. What it doesn't have is access to the different levels, except by the teleporters. It's a bit of a trade-off, isn't it? <laughs> and that became, yeah, in our practice game I had with Lewis, it, it doesn't work. <laughs> uh, it, it's too random, and you, you never get to the end zone. Yeah. So, so thanks cool. to yourself now, have got some, what I call, teleport doors, which are colour-coded. Yeah. So, effectively, a passageway to different levels. Yeah. You, you go through a blue door, you'll come out at the blue door on the next level, or if you go through a green door, you'll come out at a green door at the next level. So, you can now pick and choose how you want to navigate through the dungeon. So, is each door paired with one other door of the same colour? No, no. So, I have two sets of doors that will take you to... You can choose the level you want oh, to go okay, to. okay, brilliant. Mm-hmm. So, from the top level, you could choose to go to one board on one level or another board on the bottom level. Ah, that's clever. And then I have another set of doors that will go from the top level to the end zone level. Cool. Those are going to be important doors. <laughs> that they will be. So, oh, so right. you yeah. still got the teleporters there. You're still bringing your reserves on through the teleporters. That all works, but you now have essentially passageways to, to navigate around and, and have a little bit more. That is a very clever way around it. Are, we, are, you, are you thinking you're going to need to roll any things to roll any dice to get through those doors, or just a straight? No, yeah. no, no, it's a passageway. I love that. I See, that. I, I disagree. I, I like the idea of a, a baleful round gate type of rule. <laughs> you roll a dice on a one, it disappears forever. It would be kind of brutal if you were taking the safe route because the routes are longer going through those doors, aren't they? They're quite yes. a, yeah. So you're not going to save a lot of time. So it makes it so you can you can try and be cheeky. Go in the teleporter, hopefully coming out in, the, in, the, in their dugout, essentially, ready to score. Or you can go through the doors, take a longer route. So what that's really going to do is it's going to give you two avenues to defend as well, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Because you're going to have to defend again. Right, are they going to go the direct route through the doors? So yeah. I can take and hold that door, but i also got to defend my teleporter because they're just going to pop out. There's going to be a real problem. See, that, that will be great fun. So, uh, look, it, it's a different take on the dungeon bowl. However, I, I think it needs a bit of play testing and um, definitely. Uh, now, we'll see how we go. I do have to correct you very briefly. Rick. You said it was complete, but we all know that it's missing two, two, uh, two more end zones. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, a four-way dungeon bomb yes. would be great. I don't know how we're going to make that one work, but if anyone's going to do it, it's you. It is definitely you. Yeah, no yeah. pressure, no pressure. But uh, look forward to seeing it in September. No, Rick, you've done an amazing job with that dungeon bomb board. It looks brilliant. It does look amazing. And, uh, when you get back for your travels around the world, I certainly want to go. Yeah, I yeah. Want to, but, you Good know, mixed teams as well. But so I have to there. say that the, the the terrain on the boards. I, I found really good fun, and I know you've made another board up. Yeah, oh yeah, that, uh, and, that uh, uh, Ian and Lewis played with. And that gets the cogs ticking over with, with introducing traps and and uh, various bits and bobs. Yeah, traps would be great fun to do, and uh, we'll talk about that one a little bit later as well. Yes. Basically, we've gone crazy for some extra rules in this last few weeks, and we've just had a really great time. <laughs> it's been brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Drag Rick in here to talk about them. So, yes. uh, absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Rich, have you been painting anything? I did. I've done some painting. Have you been painting what you should be painting? A little bit. <laughs> no more ogres, but I've done a bit more work on the um on the runs and the sonics. So um I've got a few more base colours down. Not as much as I want. I really need to crack on with it. Right. But I did finish off my minotaur from my renegades. Oh brilliant. Because I finally decided that enough was enough and he was looking a bit bland. And you've gone for a slightly different skin colour with him from a normal one. He's bright red. Yeah. <laughs> They're looks, all bright red. And it looks really good. All of my Chaos Renegades. It ties them in together, it makes it look different, but actually, yeah, great one. Corn loves them greatly. <laughs> Corn loves them greatly. Corn touched. Corn touched. Touched by Corn. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I actually did a little bit, which is nice. I felt like I accomplished something. <laughs> I've also done a little bit, not enough, but a little bit. I did build all my horrors now. So yes. I've got my team. Um, it's Monday today. It is. Tournaments on Saturday, so I build them, and all I've got to do now is is is, is paint them. So uh, yeah, that'll easy be, bit. Yeah, that'll be easy. Fortunately, <laughs> they're, they're most they're just blue horrors, um, so just blue and some washes. I think I'll probably be able to get away with it. I don't have that luxury. Do you need some washes? Uh, no, I, I, I need to be able to layer them as well. <laughs> Highlight yeah. them. However, the paint scheme you've gone for is really good. Yes. I'm a bit I'm picking some of my horrors are just going to end up looking like horrors from Sigma. I mean, that is what they are, but because they've got no, they don't have weapons. much to them, is there? No, they've got daggers and some flames and things, which I think look cool enough for it to be, but I don't know. It's not, not going to win you an award, is it? It's not. No, Ian will be disappointed. Oh, well, I'm not Ian. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> I'm is. Not, I'm not that skilled <laughs> or patient at all in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I did see you putting some Dark Elves together too, didn't I? I have yet to build the Dark Elves. I was building the Van Sars. Oh, that yeah, was it. Yeah. I was building my Necromunda team, the Kill Team. So two for one on that one, but uh, <laughs> and that was just the most. So there will be some listeners out there that have built the pro elves, and there will be some listeners out there that, like me, built the pro elves at one o'clock in the morning on release day because you were excited. <laughs> and anybody who did that will, will remember that building those elves tired is difficult. Anybody who wants to build the Van Sars, just be awake, have eight coffees, <laughs> um, but not so much your handshake, just so much your hyper alert because they're answering three pieces. But I yeah, still I'm need not, to build the I'm not cards. convinced by the complexity of these. The new Games Workshop kits? Uh, look, they're great. I, I, I'm loving them, don't get me wrong. But I'm just not sure I'm understanding why they need to be so complex when they're, they're fixed positions. So you've built your Dark Elves now, haven't you? I have. How, did you, how do you think they compared to some of the other kits, that, the Blood Bowl kits that well, Games Workshop had out? The, the Pro Elves have those faces to put on. And it's great, it gives a bit of... Oh, they weren't. Oh, they're so small, they're a pain in the ass. Dark Elves had even smaller oh, no. pieces to put on, and some of them were really... You, you do it, but but it's painful. You, you, you just sit there wondering if you really need to be doing this. So once you've built them, if you look at the Human Team and the Orc Team and the Skaven Team... Yes. Okay, Skaven Tails break, but Skaven Tails have been breaking since they made Skaven. Mm. That's fine. Yeah. You know, um, it's before. But yeah, I, I don't... The models look great, but I don't know if, the, if there's enough to make it worth that hassle. Because the great thing about the human, the Skaven, and the Orc team is the starter set. Anybody could just grab a kit, put it together, and the dwarves. And, play. and the dwarves, exactly. Yeah. Uh, my only issue with the dwarves is the number plate on the back. Is it a separate it piece? It looks like it is a separate piece. It's a yeah, tiny it little piece, and it looks square until you try putting it in. And you've got to put it in the slight. You've got to find the right way around. Yeah. Because it's slightly chamfered. And that wind round me up something chronic. <laughs> so, so they've got. Progressively more complicated. So they went with dwarves, then they went to elves. They and have, dark elves. and I just wonder. I, I look. I get the complexity if you've got a miniature that you can choose how to put together. Yes, mm-hmm. but these aren't. They're, they're fixed shapes. I I I've got a theory behind this, and it's that Games Workshop hates elves as much as I do. <laughs> they're trying to make everybody else hate them as well. 
Oh my god, can you imagine the Widow of Kit? It's gonna be like it's gonna be like Lego. I don't want any more elves. Tiny Lego <laughs> bear elves. How many like we spoke about this. I think <laughs> I, my money is on Wood Elves being one of the next teams Games Workshop yeah. brings out. Really? I'm going for Undead. Oh, Undead. I, th- I think both those teams would sell really well. Camry. Camry? That would be incredible if they did that. I reckon there's a lot of love going around for Camry at the moment. There's a lot more want for Team Kings and things like that on other oh, sites. I, I just feel it's, 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 it's the one aspect of the game that you're missing. You, you've got your Dwarves, your Elves, your Humans, your Orcs, your Goblins. You've got a Chaos team. Yeah. You, you, you haven't got something that represents bash. the undead. The undead you can easily bash. Yeah, it's bash it's yeah, it's quite, not so much a Camry. It's quite specific, isn't it? Camry is yeah, probably one of the tricky ones that are out yeah. there at the moment to build. Um, I still think Bull Centaurs need to happen. Although they do. there's a great little conversion on the bubble community. That was a fantastic little conversion. Yeah. Chaos mm. Warrior Chariot Horse, horse. Bodies. Yes. But the guy did use a Forge World Chaos Warp, so that's a what, thirty pounds, you need to buy ten. I don't know, if you go in with five mates to build two centaurs each, that would be alright, but mm. I don't know. Yeah. To, to be honest, I'd do you, that. Yeah. I need a couple. <laughs> <laughs> alright, well that's, that's two, so that's four. Yep, we'll have one there. If anyone else would write this Rick, I'm sure you yeah. want. No? Rick's got the originals, I imagine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tony Stark. <laughs> Brilliant. Last thing, anyone planning on buying anything called Blood Bowl coming up? Jordel is coming out. I've not seen release dates or anything like that. And I've got Bugman. Oh, you picked up Bugman? It's not arrived yet. Ah, oh, that's a shame. Yeah. I'm not planning on buying anything yet. I actually want to complete with what I've got, but then there's not much else I want, Blood Bowl wise. Well, we're just about to go to this tournament, aren't we? Yeah. And then we're going to look at going to one in November. Yes. I've not looked too much at the rules pack. They've got Bretonians and they've got Corn. 1.2 yeah. million. Oh, that's quite cool. But I didn't think there was any sort of stats. Okay. Packs on top, so. But the thing for me is that you've got the Necromunda team, the Necromunda team, and you've got the Necromunda gang, the Cordor guys. Yes. Or Caldor, I'm not sure how to say it. I'm going to go with Cordor. I'm going to go with Cordor. Aren't they, isn't Raven there? Aren't they? I don't know. But they are very Bretonian looking, and I think there's a team in there. Huh. Yeah. yeah. I, see that. I think there's a Bretonian team in there, and I think I'm going to struggle not to have a go. So on to our first topic of the episode, mixed teams. So last episode we bandied around some ideas on how you could combine two teams. They're more like hybrid teams than mixed teams. Yes. Pick one, pick another, choose some players. Minimum of four. Minimum of four. And the re-rolls are the most expensive one, plus ten, but you get a fan factor for each one. You do. The idea being actually it takes a bit more money to coach these guys to work between each other. So, since then, Rick was very excited and offered to help us out. Yep. So, we played a few games with mixed teams. We spoke about that earlier on. Rick, how did you find running mixed teams? I loved it. I actually, I'd almost say I wish this was a more regular uh, occurrence. I thought, I, exactly I thought the same thing. I did it, it worked <laughs> so well together. <laughs> I'm a bit, I'm a bit sad about going back to regular one, one team, team, one team it, yeah. teams now. So, which teams did you run? So, I did Wood Elves and Halflings. So what did you run in that team? <clears throat> well, I had the three Treeman option. Well, that's just that's just great to start with. And two War Dancers. So less great. My huge, <laughs> you know, a huge chunk of points went into five players. So we ran this with standard one million. Yep. So standard one million teams, non league, just one game. Yeah. Um, but you know what? It worked perfectly. I had a, I think I had a thrower, Wood Elf thrower. And then halflings, and it was great. It was a great mix. So wood elves with throw teammate. That, that's the yes. best. That's the best team upgrade I can think. Of. <laughs> <laughs> Not that yes. I did it very well, but <laughs> that's um, brilliant. Um, what was your second game? What did you run in that? Uh, so second game was wood elves and dwarves. I ran six dwarf blockers. Yep. Two war dancers. A thrower and two catchers. Okay, so when we were talking about the rules, I think we did talk elves and dwarves and how that might be one of the most power gamey things you can do at Blood Bowl, but I, it wasn't that power. Okay, the score was, was ridiculous in the end. It's four or five one because he played against me and I ran my, <laughs> I ran my Skaven Goblins, which Oof. wasn't Skaven Goblins. Skaven Underworld. What was it called? Skaven Chaos. Chaos. Yes, it was Skaven <coughs> Chaos. So I ran yeah. my Skaven Chaos against you. And you know what? I didn't play 
as good as I should have done that. I, and halfway through the game, I thought to myself, ah, I've, I've done this wrong. And you know what? If I had taken out a couple of your elf players, it would have made it so much harder for you to score like you did. And he played it really well. And I was a bit worried about the Wood Elf Dwarf combination because actually they're, they're two of the, the best teams. Yeah. Two of the, 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 the war, war dancers are just war dancers phenomenally are good. But it didn't feel completely broken. I, I, I did feel like I could have done something different. How about you, Rich? Which teams did you run? I ran Ogres and Orcs. Brilliant. Against Rick. Against the Wood Elves and Halflings. Which I had two Ogres. That was great. It was fantastic. <laughs> I had two Ogres. A black orc blitz, a black orc blocker, two blitzers, a thrower, a lineman, and the rest were snotlings, runs, and um, I think I had thirteen players total, one or two rerolls because my rerolls are eighty thousand apiece. Okay, they weren't cheap, but it was great fun. I attempted to intercept the throne teammate, <laughs> failed unfortunately. <laughs> I was excited. That would have been a super moment. I think I rolled a five instead of a six and and cried inside a little. But yeah, all. It was a three-all match in the end. Wasn't it? Three-all match. All three of your touchdowns were throw teammates. Throw teammates with a succession of good rolls. Yes, I was very lucky with the dice rolls. You pulled um, a couple of yourself there, really, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, less, but I'm renowned for. <laughs> um, uh, no, I never had a. I, I never got a successful throw teammate, but I did manage to chuck a few halflings down that way. You threw the halfling all the way to the other side, and he only failed because he rolled a one on a go for it in the end zone. Did. Yes, that's that very would have true. been, I think, a one-turn touch. And then that same halfling failed to catch the ball to win the game. But and turn sixteen. And turn sixteen. Yeah, I think I saw that model in the road. Um, yeah. <laughs> if anyone's got a spare halfling, Rick could use a replacement. No, brilliant. I made some terrible team choices based on the models that I had at hand. So recently I've moved house, so most of my stuff is in storage still, except yes. for the ones I carry around in my car. So I played against both of you. When I played against Rick, I took my Skaven and Chaos. My thinking was, you know what, I could chuck some, some beef into my Skaven, because when I play Skaven, it's all about the gutter runners and just human shield, the rest of it. So I thought, actually, Chaos, strength for human shields. And some of my basic game plan worked okay, but the lack of block, with rerolls being more expensive, and only running two gutter runners, I didn't, I, I feel like I, I didn't get, I didn't really get the team I was trying to fight. Mm, yeah. It was fun though. And it was fun and I didn't mind, but it was a great challenge. So you've got a new team you're playing against a new team you've never played against. And it was wonderful to be playing Blood Bowl for the first time, but just at a more advanced level. Yeah. Well, I, I think uh, choosing Wood Elves and Dwarves, to be fair, I thought I was choosing a team with skills. So, you know, the, the dwarf linemen are just, they're, they're skilled up. Dwarf yeah. linemen are brilliant. Fantastic. The thrower has passed. The war dancers have everything. <laughs> um, everything. And you, you, you know, so I, I do get it. It's a, it's, it's a strong, it's you've a, got, you've got a well nice front team. line with agile players that can perform because they've got skills. But I think you could take those guys out. I think, I don't think, yeah. I don't think, I think that team could be beaten. And like mm -hmm. I said, by taking out the elves, I think, what I went for wasn't ideal, and my other team was just for fun, like <laughs> Skaven and Goblins. So basically it was half a Skaven team and special weapons with Goblins chucked in there as well, and it was great fun. Uh, so many of my guys died. Yeah, I, I decimated them. <laughs> it was amazing. But then I brought a, a heavy team. You were, were you running double Chaos, weren't you? Chaos and Nurgle. Yeah, amazing. The strength, of, well, the, the resilience of that team was was brilliant. Yeah. And you did keep Mono blitzing the Fnatic, which, yeah. by the way, is a brilliant tactic to take yeah. out that special weapon, because as soon as you knock him down, he's gone. Yes. So that was really good. Called the referee. You rolled did. a six, which was great, so I got to use him twice. But it was great fun to be able to chuck in some secret weapons with my Skaven team. But again, my strategy wasn't there, but it was still just so much But it's got potential. I mean, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the Chaos team more than I did the Ogres and Orcs. Although it, although the ogres had the throw team, mate, it was just the the dominance you can put on a chaos and Nurgle team against others is insane. I ran the beast of Nurgle, two chaos warriors, the the Nurgle warrior, yeah, Bestigor, four or five rotters, and a minotaur. Not Bestigor, beastman, yeah, and a minotaur, and just I, I kept the the Nurgle warrior behind the. the the Beast of Nurgle, so you never had an issue. Plus, if you had anything close on a throw, it was, you had two lots of disturbing presence. Which was really useful. 
So I actually felt that the, the way that the, you guys came up with the, the the rule composition for building a team worked really well. Yeah. So when you were picking your team, what were you thinking about, Frick? Oh, I think the first one was wood elves and halflings, and I, I just wanted to have a bit of fun. I, I wanted to use halflings, I wanted to give them a go, and I thought that there's a chance to put three treemen on the front line. And that was great as well, and it wasn't broken. No, it wasn't at all. It was. It was. It brought a yeah. different, a different plus side and a different downside. The plus side being is you had about eighteen strength on the line. <laughs> yeah. Um, and armor twenty five. And yet, uh, yeah. he managed to knock down. Rich managed to knock down my three treemen in one. Yeah. On one of the drives, all yeah. three were down, so it was almost impossible for you to get them back up again. I had to focus on it. Yeah. Because there wasn't an option. And look, granted, I had the ogres, but I still needed to bring a couple of guys in to be able to assist on that. And sacrificed the, the black hawk <laughs> on several occasions until I managed to get one of the other ones. But down. You, you, you do. You, you sit there when you're building these teams. You do sit there and think about what combinations are really going to work. You, you know, for me, the, the wood elf and halfling went together very naturally. It went together pretty. And good. the dwarf and the wood elf went together very naturally. I think, provided you get the composition right between the teams you're using, there's not necessarily a bad combination. Having said that, an ogre and a halfling team could be just. <laughs> <laughs> Chaos. I don't know, that'd be great. Treeman, ogres, snotlings. Oh my. Ooh, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> well, snotlings are so cheap and they still have three teammates. You could run. And Titchy. Yeah. Two plus dodger. Absolutely. Yeah, right. See, that's just great fun mm-hmm. as well. Side step. And um, I think we figured out that there's nearly 550 different blood oil teams. Yeah, just over, I think it was. Yeah, so you're playing that against 550 other blood oil teams. It's an incredible 25,000 games. It would make a fantastic tournament. It would make a great tournament. We need a mixed team. Bonehead tournament. Super League. Super League. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a bit of a bit of a throwback <clears throat> to the old Dungeon Bowl team compositions in some respects. Well, this is what inspired it. Mm. It's because we're looking at the Dungeon Bowl well, there's a Dungeon Bowl video game and there's the old Dungeon Bowl rules pack, and all those teams were based on one main race, one other race, and then the big guy. You were every team every team basically had to be from multiple races, mm. which made it different, which made it really interesting. You know, elves and dwarves and humans with norse and you know minotaurs everywhere, and that's what kind of that's what that's what made us think about what we could do with this, and it was great fun. It, it, look, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed it. It was nice to be able to look at something and not know exactly what you want to do with it or how to go about it. And although you've got the the, the, the mixture of the two, granted, the, the chaos team and the nurgle team are very similar in the way they play. You still had to be aware of what was going on. I mean, having a tentacled player, being able to, to tie up anything that was remotely trying to dodge out, which you struggled with oh, man. two Good. or three occasions. Gutter runners. Yeah. yeah. They were yeah. Having tentacles, being those gutter runners in there, absolutely just took out basically half my team. I didn't use <laughs> the, the beast for blocking very often. Literally just for, for just moving and placing. Blocked him up there to help people in the air, which was great, and then you could counter punch with the Minotaur. Yes. However, re-rolls, there weren't very many of them. I had one. Yeah, mm. but I don't think I used it in the first half of our game, no. and that's it because it limits. You say it limits your choices, but you play a little bit smoother and you just accept things, which makes for a quicker game. You play smarter. So I think when we were playing these games, actually they were probably about a quarter of an hour faster than a yeah. regular blood bowl game. You yeah. don't have the re rolls, yeah. and it just opened up a whole load of different tactics. Yes. So I think this could be a really great way of of taking blood bowl competitive level. To the next stage. Yeah. Because at the moment you've got set pieces, you've got six different teams, you've got optimal builds for them, and you see people run. That's why tournaments tend to do like uh, 1100 and some skills, 1200 and some skills, yeah. which is a great way of, again, they're doing the same thing that we were doing, which is taking Blood Bowl, making it slightly different, and increasing the ch- increasing their choices. Yeah. This could be great fun. So, yes, Rich, I think a, a, you know, a one day, three round tournament with uh, mixed teams. Would be absolutely that great. That would be fun. great fun, actually. Yeah. New Forest. With three teammate rules. Yes. Of course, the three teammate rules. Do you think mixed teams like this would work in a league environment? Yes. In amongst standard teams, you mean? In amongst yes. standard teams. I reckon so. I think you would initially feel stung because of the cost of the rerolls. Initially. Yeah, you'd, but have a, you'd have a slower burn. Yes, you would. But I think. I don't think it's broken. It, it, it would be interesting to watch. I mean. I had very expensive players. Yes. You lose some of those, and that will impact dramatically. You could yeah. have pro elf syndrome. Yeah. 
Yeah. If you lost a, you know, for example, in your in your Wood Elf Dwarf thing, if you ran that in a league, and you lost a, a, a war dancer or a catcher, mm-hmm. you're waiting two, three games to be able to rebuy one. You're playing with a lone alignment. And when you've got a Wood Elf and Halfling combination, you, you know those expensive players' loss would be a, a big loss because your Halflings are going to get used as well. Would you have built your teams differently if you were starting a you know, a, a six to ten game league as opposed to a one off match. No, go big or go home. No, brilliant. No, I love it. I definitely I'd wouldn't like. I wouldn't be sacrificing it. Because it's it's one of those things where you want to, to start as strong as possible. There is always a risk of losing whoever. It doesn't matter what game you play, you could I I my very, very first game on Blood Bowl two online was a Chaos team. And the very first turn was throw a rock. It hit my Minotaur and killed it. <laughs> the very, very first game, the very first turn, the very first action, Welcome to a Blood rock Bowl. killed my mind at all. And I rage quit. But it's just the way Blood Bowl is. You, you could lose anybody at any yeah. time. And if you go into it thinking, oh no, you know what, I might lose a war dancer, I'm not going to do it yet. It, it, you're it sacri- is, but... You're, you're, stemming, you're stemming your own... I, I guess in a league thing. you do have to think about it, don't you? Because, for instance, me playing vampires next season, I'm I'm deliberately choosing more re-rolls. That's what made me ask vampires. the question. And so would I, for instance, get a few more positional players and cut a treeman out yeah. of that mix? Yeah, well, taking a, you know, for example, in your dwarf and elf team, would you have taken a couple of elf linemen instead of, you know, the thrower and a catcher there to get that extra re-roll with the view of buying them later on a slow burn? So I think if you ran a league with mixed teams, you'd start off with a lot of linemen from your split races and a few extra re-rolls to build up to that. Mm. So, so you're you're in a position where you need a journalist. You bring in an alignment yeah. for each race. <clears throat> well, the the rule for bringing in the journeyman is a player from a naught to sixteen thing. So in the undead teams where you've got two options of skeletons or zombies, you just get to pick. It would oh. be the same. Oh, okay. What would be difficult is if you had, if, yeah, if you had an undead team and another team, you'd actually have a choice of three naught to sixteen positional players to choose from. But yeah, it would balance out. Yeah. At the end of the day, you're still making a decision, aren't you? Yeah, and we get any more players. You should get bigger trees. But what that would also do is that would give you a little bit of a way to manage your team value. If you were running a team where you had a choice of different linemen, you could take the 50k one to keep your team value down, or you could go, well, actually, I'll just take the 70k uh, linemen or whatever. Ogres and orcs. You could t- take a 20k snotling. That's it. That's a great shout. Mm. Yeah, you could buff that easily. Yeah. You could chuck that straight in. I just think it opens up a whole load of interesting choices. I like it. I like would you it. change anything, Ben? Team wise? Uh, me, I, yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. I basically put together what I had as opposed to, to what I what I could have done. Yeah. That is exactly why I bought a dwarf team. So in the post today, my dwarf team. <laughs> <laughs> because actually a dwarf human team would be something that thematically I'd love. That works really nicely. Yeah, I would paint them as, as a single team. Yes. And actually I'd like to try and see how that team progressed. In like a spare kickabout league. Well, now it's funny it. you say that because I was wondering, do yeah. I build a mixed team? Let's do it. And I just, I think having a mixed team unified for a paint scheme, and just well, this is what we spoke about last last episode was that mixed team. You build your franchise. You really do. You've got a, you've got an identity. Yep. Because there are so many different combinations, and even if you know, even if I also went for a chaos Nurgle team. The build would probably be slightly different, and we'd have a different feel. And uh, yeah, I just love the idea of having a franchise and being like, oh, which, which what are you team are playing? I'm playing against the the, the the Marauders. Well, I know that the Bridges Marauders are just a whole bunch of chaos scribblies. And then you've got that famous team feeling, that franchise team feeling yeah. that is developing and building its own story. Anything else you guys want to mention about mixed teams? Other than do it, no, no. I've got to give it a go. If you haven't tried it, try it. Yeah, just yeah. have some fun. Get a couple of friends, or just yeah. one friend. Just take some teams, put them together quickly. Just you'll see there's so much fun. Even if you're lucky dipper, the lucky dipper. Put, put your hand in a pan. Even not you're on the, on the mixed teams. Yeah. So just put all of the teams twice. All the teams twice in a hat. See, I'm more of a okay. purist. I, I need to. I, I need to keep it. I, I need to keep the teams working. No. In 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 the in the what what the alignments they should be in. I guess. <sighs> yep. I agree with alignments, but I think you'll find that the teams we picked they were actually in alignment worked in basically an alignment fashion. Yeah, they did. Yeah, and it felt right. 
Mm. Dwarves and elves was a bit of a stretch, but you're paying that cost with re-rolls. Look, I'm not against it, by any means, but elves and orcs just doesn't work for me. No. Me neither. Dark elves, elves and orcs. Involved. Dark elves and orcs does. So, we spoke about choosing teams, we spoke about buying teams, we spoke about playing teams. Yep. And we spoke about alignments, which we all think actually makes a lot of sense, and we yep. did it instinctively anyway. Yeah. So yes, I think an orc human team would be fine because I think humans would definitely be neutral because they're everywhere. They're in all the chaos teams. Yeah, that's true. Right, wonderful. Let's go on to the next topic. Okay, brilliant. Now our second topic with the episode is going to be about terrain and obstacles in Blood Bowl. So I'm not sure if we've mentioned this before, but we like Dungeon Bowl. We like the idea of Dungeon Bowl. And in Dungeon Bowl was some rules for smacking people into walls and rules for statues and pits. As part of Rick building his dungeon ball board, we had a load of walls and things that were left over from when we cast them up. So we put them on bases and thought, you know what, let's, let's chuck them on a, on a blood bowl pitch and see what kind of effect it has on the game. So Rick was kind enough to play a game with me. And, and uh, So how did you find running with terrain in blood bowl? I loved it. I, I loved it. That's, that's great. So what we did was we started off the, the game and we, we just had the, the, the plane pitch and we alternated putting terrain on the board now that ranged from single square statues so we had the one square statues the one square stones we had a two by two big statue yep. and we had a three by one wall each yep. so we alternated placing them put them in random positions with a viewer at half time we'd swap sides hmm. so we'd have so yes, we'd have yeah. Yeah, yeah the experience of both sides yeah, to try and broke it up a bit. But also because um, one of our one of the guys from our club Ian was talking about why don't we change pitch sides at half time. We did chat about that. Yeah, because there's actually no difference yes. for most of it. But adding terrain and adding asymmetrical sides would have had that. Mm. So we took turns placing the terrain. And what effect did you have that what did you think that had on the game really? Uh, surprisingly very little. The game was still free flowing. It was still you blood you still have your, you, you, you know, you're still playing a, a normal game, right. but the terrain just altered the way you can set up a little bit. You suddenly were directing the opposition through certain routes, or trying to direct the opposition through certain routes. It, it, it just added a bit of dynamics to the game that that I found really enjoyable. With regards like throwing and passing, yep. Could you pass over? So we had uh, a single small stone each. Um, when we deployed, which you could throw over fine, but it would actually block movement and you could punch people into. Yeah. And all of the others, the walls and the statues, you couldn't throw. Okay, um, okay. So, you, so you couldn't throw through the wall, because yeah. it was wide. You could throw past the statues, but the statue would essentially have an intercept rock. Yeah. So if you threw and your template crossed one of the statues or you know, the, the tall statues, so you, yeah. you hit it as well as yeah. you go around. And if, if the statue essentially intercepted your roll, it would bounce off. Where that where that gets you thinking is, for instance, if you had a forest filled, yeah, where a tree would take up one square, but the branches would block you throwing. See, that's a great point. I like that. It would block you throwing. It would, yeah, absolutely. How would the kick function work on a forest pitch? So we had we did have a moment where the kick nearly landed and scattered into a wall and bounced off. But due to it, I think I probably every time I kick off, it needs to be a touchback anyway, somehow. So <laughs> when we came to do the kick off, it was like, oh, where am I going to place the ball? Because if it lands there, it'll bounce off the wall and it'll go this direction, which was quite cool. How would a tree with that work? Uh, probably probably the same. It just lands on the tree and scatters and ends up at the base of it in one round of direction. That would make sense, yeah. Or it just, you know, scatters in several spaces. So the basic rules we ran with, with, the, uh, with the terrain was we had, um, we had a wall. It was three squares wide. You couldn't move through it. You couldn't throw past it. But you could bounce a wall, uh, bounce a ball off it, uh, as per the dungeon ball rules, which we didn't use. We had a stone statue, a big one, a small one. The idea being is you could throw past it, but it would make an intercept roll. So essentially, you'd have to roll a two plus, or you'd bounce it off the statue and it would mm-hmm. scatter. And the same rule applied for all of them, which was if you got blocked into it. So if you had a pushback where you would go into the wall, you took an armor roll at plus one as if it had mighty blow. Okay. So one thing I did manage to pull off was, uh, I was using, I think, uh, <laughs> and Rick had left one of his guys near the statue and ended up setting a, a two or three block into the statue, using it as a 
using it to break the armor and yes. taking a player out, which was quite cool. So those are the basic rules we used for it. There are some other terrain types out there that actually you could open up with. Now I know, Rick, you're thinking about the forest pitch. What would you? What effect would you have for trees? I think it's a restricted throw. So you can't throw past them. I almost wonder if you can you can get a bolt stuck in the tree that you have to block the tree to get it down or something. I I, I don't know. You you, you could oh, do I, something like that. Yeah. And if, hold on. Throw a bit of a curveball here. Yeah. Say that you throw a ball on a one, it gets stuck in a tree, right? <laughs> on another roll of a one. You find out that that thing's a treeman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then it, and yeah. if there's someone that's like, if there's someone that's nearby, almost like a bomb effect, on a four plus, he's knocked them down. And then he launches the ball 2d6. But, you know, <laughs> it, it gives you an opportunity to, but then that's uh, a tree I don't know, for the rest put, of a, the put a river through a field, oh, yes, or, or a lava pit. Bushes would be great. So, got to jump over bushes. So, Rick and I played with upwards terrain. We chucked some walls, we chucked some statues. We had a couple of other friends of ours, Ian and Lewis, who we've also mentioned on, on the podcast. Ian is a uh, award, multiple award winning painter, and Lewis is good guy Lewis, who is one of the lightest person. The nicest man in the world. Around. Rick and I played with um, 3D terrain with the walls and the statues. Uh, Ian and Lewis played on the table next to us with a, a pitch I've been working on, where it has two large segments of the wine zones. Just, just gone. They're just gone. Mm. It's all, all a big pit. Um, and the rules that I set up for them was that all of that was the same as a pitch surf. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, no, no difficulties, no difference. The idea being, actually, it takes them a while to get back out of the hole. If they're knocked out, you know, if they're, if they're out for the game, no lasting injuries, but they're just out for the end because they're too far down the hole to come back on. And they had an absolutely crazy game. They oh, did, didn't they? I'm not sure they played Bud Bowl. I think they just spent most of the time pushing each other down the holes. <laughs> so, you know, these, <laughs> it was, there were quite big, uh, quite big gaps. So two, two gaps wide and about six, six squares long, which led to a lot of pushing. But it looked a lot of fun as well. I know that you were talking about traps as well. Yeah. Traps, pits. There's rules for those in Dungeon Bowl. Actually, you had like little I think, well, if, if, if for those of you that remember the second edition Blood Bowl, there were there were rules for traps. Okay. There as well, and yeah, you know, trampoline traps or physically making a board and having that on there was just. I mean, that 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 board that you made was fantastic to watch, and the guys were having a ride at the time. It was great fun. Even like me and Milton were playing a separate game down the way. It was great fun just to listen to the, the whooping and hollering and then, no! <laughs> <laughs> and it was just brilliant. But I was thinking, with those types of pitches, talking about the forest pitch, talking about the, the ones on the whole, you can make some seriously good thematic pitches out of that. Like, that's that's a wood elf home pitch right there. Yeah. You can maybe make a glade out of the middle of it so you get that sort of free air and the rest yeah. you've got trees dotted about. The, the, the one with the holes in the side could easily be a chaos pitch. Like with that, or a Nurgle pit, something like that, where you've got that pot of blood down the side, or something yeah. like that. I wonder if you could come up with something for multi floored little steps that. How that great would that be? Two, me, two end zones. At the bottom, you can go up or down. So I was looking at um, one of the rules packs for um, one of the tournaments that are coming up. Um, I think it's the Santi Slam, forgive me if it isn't. But They've got uh, the different rounds of the competition. They have different special rules. And on one of them, you set up three teleporters on each side of your pitch. So I'd set up three teleporters on my side. Then they will scatter. So you can't put them directly where they end. But the idea being is that you're playing Blood Bowl, but you also have little teleporters you can bounce around on. Beautiful. So I think having a Blood Bowl game with just a couple of random elements to change up the game, whether it's holes in the ground, whether it's teleporters, whether it's walls to smack people into and, mm. and change the blocking lanes, because that was one of the things I found really interesting, was I was playing against your vampires, and there was a, a gap that was maybe two or three squares wide. I could hold it with one guy. Yes. You couldn't run around it. You had to go through him, which really slowed that, that angle down. Um, and I think anything that you can chuck on very easily to a Blood Bowl pitch and change up the game and make it new and make it different challenges, I think it was great fun. And it can be different every time. And to be fair, I think that's, that's very in keeping with the game. It is very, yeah, I you, think. You, you know, it, it's... Well, you get the Chaos Cup. In the in the, the whole lore of Blood Bowl, you get the Chaos Cup. The person who scores the last touchdown in the Chaos Cup final gets a mutation. I'm sure that's what it is. Like the Chaos Gods have decided that that person is 
a jam. Deal, and, or, and, and you get a free mutation. You know, you could have or something. Thought, you could have something like a, a chaos cup. Every turn, you roll the dice, <laughs> and if a number comes up, a chasm appears randomly. Brilliant. You know, that would be great. You, you could just add these random events in that. You can almost have a set thing for each number, one through to six. And then every time you pick up the ball, if it's to do with something, that uh, might spend ages re- rolling every single time. Make it on a turnover. On a turnover. Yes. Just for a cinematic reason. Just for, actually, you don't always get turnovers, but you regularly, no. most of the time is that. Could be, boom, a guy tries to knock a guy out, he falls over, lands on a, a tough bit of ground, which causes some, some other part of the pitch to collapse. Yeah. Or, you know, something like that. That would be just, like, great yeah, random So fun. you could have another... Do you remember uh, in the old Space Marine game they had the Vortex missile? Oh, yeah. You could have some sort of Vortex randomly like going around the field, <laughs> Almost sending like an endless players spell. to the reserve box or something. Yeah, like an endless spell. Or a monster. So we just had a giant spider drop from uh, Richard's ceiling onto his computer in the, in the background. It was so loud that we could hear it, and I had to... <laughs> <laughs> and undoubtedly, I had to edit the crashing sound out. <laughs> but, you know, actually, on that picture with the big holes in the ground, you can have monsters. Yes. You can have, ro- wire, you know, wandering monsters, a wandering tree man in the pitch. That'd be you, know, you have that tree, the ball gets lodged in it, someone blocks it, someone gets pushed into the tree, or on a full class, he becomes a tree man. Or and a giant. Man, yeah, or a giant, and that just blitzes every time. Obviously, we here at the Bonehead Podcast love random rules. Could it work in a league environment? Yeah. Yeah, I think it could be a lot of fun. It sounds like something that would probably be better on a tournament basis. So, round one, you're in the good pitch. Round two, you're in the cave pitch. Something like that. Something where you've got that, that change up every time. Because otherwise, all you're doing is making a stadium without making a stadium. That's really true. So, they are, you know, these kind of rules are very similar to the stadiums that are out in the death zones. And we found that we don't want to use those in a league environment because it throws out the balance a bit too much. Now, I think that could probably be countered a little bit, even by allowing anyone that partakes in a stadium or with stadium special rules, you know, an extra D3 times 10 gold at the end of the building. Mm-hmm. You know what, because it gets the fans interested. You know, play with a, a, a you know, a play enough pitch that's got holes in it, you're going to get more fans watching it, you're going to get more money, but... So I think in a league environment, so we're about to start, you know, World War Four, our fourth season, you know, something like actually, yeah, if you want to use stadium rules, you get an extra ten thousand at the end of the end of the pitch. If you want to play with, you know, more dangerous rules, you get an extra D three times ten. So you can have that, right? Do you want to use a stadium? Oh, I do need the money. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Let's but... play with a dangerous stadium so that I can try and get that extra gold back. Yeah. But it counted off by the fact that I might lose my more answer. But I've, I've lost one already. I need some money fast. Let's play in a risky stadium with holes in the ground to get more money from that. But I think risky for all. Yeah, it's not just risky for you. No. One time, is it? So I think in a league environment, having that choice would be quite fun. I like the idea of stadiums. I, I certainly think tournament style is a good idea to get some practice in and and uh, trial it. Oh, I think a one day tournament, a one day terrain tournament, would be great fun. Yeah. And also, because I'm a war gamer at heart, so I started with right at the beginning of the game, we each put three pieces of terrain down, and then we roll off to choose the side. Having that in Blood Bowl, that game we played, was actually kind of like, oh, this is quite. Yeah, cool. I really enjoyed changing sides. Yeah, because it completely changes up your lanes and your goals, and it was yeah. really interesting. And I would love to play that again. Yeah, I would too. Um, but it could be something that's fun. It's actually, you know, what you got to, you each bring three pieces of terrain. Total amount is twelve squares. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah, you not can. even three pieces of terrain. Just you get nine squares worth of terrain. You can have one big three by three piece if you want. Giant. You can have nine <laughs> columns. You know, it just could be a really interesting way of, of changing up the game without changing it up that much. No, you keep you, you and I, rules, aren't you? Yeah, we were still playing Blood Bowl. Yes, we were. Your your vampires still played like vampires. My Skaven still very much played like Skaven. Yes. <laughs> it was just that extra element of tactical changing. Which I thought yeah. was really interesting. Yeah, I thought it's good fun. So that's terrain and obstacles in Blood Bowl. Um, as always, if anyone out there has used any rules like this or has any feedback or any ideas, please drop us a line because we'd love to hear from you.
Okay, so that takes us to the star player of the week. Yes. Rich, what have we got this week? We have got a Saurus and Slan available player by the name of Slibli. S-L-I-B-L-I. I have experience of using Slibli. Used him, her, it, against Lewis when we played um, Lizards versus Nizards. Ah, oh, this is your Tyranid team. It was my Tyranids, my Tyranids. Who was more of a punt, really, because it seemed thematic and, and quite enjoyable, but turned out to be a real thorn in Lizard's side. Lewis's side. I've got too many Lizards on my mind. <laughs> a real thorn in Lewis's side. Movement of seven, strength of four, agility of one, armour of nine. So, basically a, a slightly faster Saurus Warrior Yeah, is all they are. Along with Lona, there's block, grab, guard, and stand firm. So... Put him in a position alongside a, a couple of other players, and, and he can cause real problems. Guard is like guard along with another couple of other sauruses. You've basically got a, a line of a line of strength five saurus. I found all of the the traits there brilliant. I, at one point, I was feeding skinks to my croxigal by using grab. So you played lizards against lizards. Lizards, lizards against one. lizards. Yeah. And I was literally grabbing Lewis's lizards, Lewis's skinks. Every time it was a dodge roll or a or a push move, uh, sorry, a dodge a dodge um, result or a push result, and literally just passed them over to whoever was next so using was grab using the grab skill. So Slibley comes in at two hundred and fifty thousand worth every piece of gold for me. When you really when you was. get to that kind of territory, you you've got that internal arc. So if you if you're down two hundred and fifty thousand, you've got to do the question of is it worth a half inch effort? Yes, I think so, because the half inch chef, yes, you could end up with three extra rerolls, provided you win a 50-50 dice roll on each, on each roll. Whereas with this guy, other than Lona, he's, he's a fairly safe bet. Strength 4 with block is brilliant. Yep. I mean, you know, mm. Saurus Warriors, Black Orb Blockers, Chaos Warriors, you're desperately after block, so he comes with that. Grab, you said, is brilliant for setting up additional blocks on players. Yep. Guard, he just helps everyone he's next to. Stand firm, did that come in handy at all? Yeah, because they can't push him out of the way. So he just stands there. And he can still retain his guard. The guys who are in base contact with him have plus one strength, so they're not going anywhere either. No. That is a heck of a front line. He, yeah, he was absolutely brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And I think I beat Lewis 3 now. Amazing. And the only difference... Absolutely. So you'd recommend using him again then? Oh, 100%. I've made him. So this is... Um, <laughs> <laughs> there is a Slibly Saurus. Oh, a Slibly star player made. So this coming weekend at the Mana Bowl, I'm using a Lizardman team. You can take star players. So, I don't know. I feel a bit disingenuous using a Saurus in a stunty league. But this, yeah, it could be a really great choice for some extra muscle. But 250k. It's a lot of money. It's a bit core of your hip. So I take it you were playing your new Lizardman team. Yeah, Lewis's, yeah so it was Lewis's stock one team. million and against his league team. Brilliant. But it, it made such a big difference. It really did. I didn't run as many skinks. I only ran five skinks. Well, that's probably about right. I think Lewis only took four to start off with, yeah. It was just fantastic. Really, really couldn't like, praise it enough, really. If I could make him a permanent feature, I'd <laughs> be more than happy to, to build a team around him. you have to run a very cheap team for that. You would have to run a very cheap team, but... Okay, so I'm going to ask the question. Him or Morgan Thorg? Him. Really? The, the price difference. What are you getting? You're getting one extra movement. You're getting two less strength. But yeah. then when you're looking at strength four amongst the team, which has got a lot of strength fours, it's not that much to lose. You know, because you've got an automatic strength five with guard. Morg doesn't have guard. But he does have edge three. So this guy has got movement seven, which is really good, but edge one, so he can't carry a ball. He's not carrying ball, which is also quite good in a league environment because you don't want your star players scoring SPP. Yes. Mm. I mean that's something that you found before with uh, whip arm. Yes. With blue grip whip arm, is that he provides the ball to other players. Yes. Which means he doesn't actually atrophy you. Now some of the elf star players, or even Griff. Yeah. They're all scorers. Yeah. And I, I had a similar issue with Morg when I played you. Yes. Because he caused three casualties. Yeah, of course, he's, he's lapping up the SPP. But I didn't get it anywhere else. But from the looks of it, Slibley's a great support player yes. that can actually take a punch. So you could be running seven Sauruses, a Croxigore, and, you know, 
two of them are plus one strength. Yeah. That's yeah. yeah that is a massive total yeah, massive table turner. Yeah, you can you can really dictate play, and I've not really experienced any players with grab previously. But he was handy. You can start moving him into to the pathway of guys on the edge. Move him onto the edge and shove him off the pitch. And you're not even trying anything. All because of a move, a, a push move. Push and there's a lot more opportunity to use a player that's not costing so much. Yes. I can't really praise him enough. That's like, brilliant. It, it really was a, a game changer. And we know how strong Lewis's lizards are. Yeah. Okay. And so, <laughs> don't, don't you <laughs> Using Slippery, I took out his crops on turn one or two. That's fantastic. And purely because of the card. So, we're big on start players here. We are. Massive um, start players. <clears throat> Have you had a chance to use very many of them, Rick? No. Is that mostly because you start with, because uh, you end up playing one million flat games? No. I just tended to go for the re-roll for the Halfling Chef. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I think, in hindsight, with a little bit of regret, I think I'd rather... Try and I, I played oh, yeah. half elf in my la, uh, high elf in my last league, so, and although at that stage there was less elf choices of star player. Yeah, we've had some more come uh, out. N- now story. we've got some more that's come mm-hmm. out. I, I, I think I'd like to to start having a go. So, what kind of price points do you think are are good ones for star players? Because I think less than two hundred, you know, round about the one hundred and fifty mark is a really great price point for a star player. Yeah. I think when you're pushing 300, it really does bring in that question of, do I take the half new chef or do I run this star player? Yeah. And I think, I know you say with a bit of regret, but what you were doing by taking the half new chef was just trying to make the team you already had more efficient, mm-hmm. and which would have kept your team progressing better in a league environment. I think that's yeah. a really, I think that's a pretty safe shout. Yeah. That's why I like the star players that are 150, 160, like you, Grip, which you said, um, which you have a lot of success mm. with. And, you know, all the special weapon players, they're only 100, they're only 150k. Yeah. I used Halfling Chef a lot when I was practicing against uh, James. I wasn't getting much for, for for the money spent. And looking back on it, I would have been better off taking a, a helmet or something yeah, similar to be able to start taking things out. Look, look I, think, I think you're dead right, Ben. In a league situation, you, you want to build your own team up. You don't want your star players getting star player points and taking that away from mm. the growth of your team. But I would certainly like to be playing more games where I, I have an option to choose and play with some of these star players that are out there. I think that's a great shout, because they are so interesting. And here, we like playing Blood Bowl in different ways. And chucking some star players in is actually a great... It changes your team. It does something different. Mm. So I know you guys were talking earlier about some kind of star player allowance. Yes. And, and having a, a set limit. So if you want to take a, a Morgan Thor, that's all well and good, but your opponent could be having two players that total up to the same amount or up to a set amount. So if it's a, a 450 limit, which would have taken into account the likes of Morgan Thor, because he's at 430. I think so, yeah. If I remember rightly. I could get for that Luke Rip Farm and Guffle Possible, mm. which gives me a throw around a catcher. So if we, if we had a tournament afternoon or something where you you had a, a 1 million gold team plus 450 points worth of star player allowance yep or we'll just to build around it or we'll just yeah. chuck in 450 points of inducements or yeah, yeah. So they can have no choice but it means you're going to pick up something you're not just going to go for one of three extra rerolls and, and 18 cakes yeah <laughs> not 17 um, not 17 <laughs> I, I, yeah, because some of the star players are really cheap, so it gives you that option of taking those guys and buying it out, but it means you can run Morg. And yeah. you could technically do what uh, Goblin players do and run your team at 800, so you can have 700 points of, um, of inducements yeah. for bribes and star players, but it means that the guys who play 1 million top tier, 1, 1.5 tier teams get to use those guys. So, Rick, you said high elves. High elves, in fact, elf teams, they don't get to use star players very often. No, because their team value is always so high. They're playing against other guys. Guys die, but the linemen you chuck in there are almost as expensive as, as positionals. Because mm. I know you're a fan of... Well, what's the um, elf star player that's coming out soon that you're excited it's about? It's Jordel. Jordel Freshbreeze. Mm. Now, I know we don't like to talk about more than one star player in a single session, because <laughs> otherwise it goes on forever. But um, Jordel is 260, and he's got an absolute ton of skills. 
you wouldn't normally take him, I don't think, in a league, because if you're down that much, you're going to try and buffer your team up. Yeah. But running some kind of, uh, I don't know, it could even be a, a pitch, a pitch star. I mean, like, actually, we're going, to, we're going to play in the star player bowl this week. So week three of the league, everybody gets 500 points, 500 gold to spend on inducements, yeah. star player week. Yeah. We're going to run star player week, but actually... I'm gonna take a, you know, I'm gonna take a mercenary, uh, mercenary death roll, or death roll off my dwarfs, and Barrack Far Blast. Yeah. Yeah. And it would just be great fun to get those players out. Just something that's a bit different. Yeah, well, yeah I would, I would love to see the star players being used more often. I, I get in a league, it's perhaps not not so appropriate, but I, I think we should be running some yeah, games. Where we can't do the, the the random weeks. Yeah. We're just going. You know what? There's been an influx of money from the matches played over the last two weeks as a result the commissioner has released 500k to each player to each team sorry to bring in inducements to bring in inducements I think that'd be great fun go nuts so that's all we're going to talk about with star players this time round so thank you very much for joining us here at the Bonehead Podcast and thank you very much Rick for joining us on this very special occasion my pleasure thank you for having me okay see you next episode and remember two heads aren't always better than one <laughs>